maintaining an ROC of 25% plus, elevating non-led business to over 30%, using 30% plus renewable power and reducing energy consumption by 10% underscores our commitment to sustainable development, increasing the proportion of value-added products to 50% and proactive risk management through back-to-back -back hedging will contribute to resilient and sustainable margins. With our DNA of 31 plus years and 12 eco-conscious state-of-art manufacturing facilities across the globe, global footprints in 70 plus countries, integrated supply chain, and uh, which is backed by strict government norms of BWMR and EPR, and robust stakeholder support, we are confident in achieving our vision 2028. That's all from my end. I would now request to open the floor for questions and answers. Thank you, and over to you, Mr. Manish. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on your touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handset while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. The first question is from the line of Mr. Amit Dixit from ICIC Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thanks for taking my question. I have a couple of questions. The first one is on the vision. So earlier it was uh, the vision to 2027, but now in this presentation we see vision to 20, 2028. So just wanted to understand exactly what has changed in the vision uh, whether we are thinking of delaying certain CAPEX elements or whether the CAPEX uh, is expected to go up further or there are some risks or challenges that we see that has resulted in this delay of uh, one year? Uh, so uh, actually what we are doing is we are uh, uh, doing a rolling uh, four-year vision. So uh, last year it was 27, so going forward it is vision 2028. We have incorporated some additional uh, 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 landmarks in this vision, especially uh, on EAT front, as I've mentioned, and also we have uh, increased uh, certain other uh, uh, landmarks also. For example, uh, in Vision 2027, we we are mentioning that uh, the non-led business would be 25%, but in Vision 2028, uh, the non-led business, we have increased the, uh, the percentage to around 30% plus. Uh, so it, it's in line with the Vision 2027, but we are giving visibility for one year further. Okay, wonderful. Uh, got it, actually. So that will be like uh, next year to revision 2029, then with some that's possibly that's more true. things added. Okay, understood, understood. That. Uh, the second question is that since uh, we are working with MCEC and there has been some kind of, uh, you know, circular also being floated on inclusion of uh, ABC12, perhaps for the, uh, so that would uh, facilitate hedging. And uh, does this also mean that our aluminium capacity, particularly in India operations, you know, now since we have got a good hedging uh, thing. So that uh, capacity uh, utilization would also improve. If so, you know, possible to share some numbers where we can, uh, what we can see once the hedging is uh, is active actually on MCX. Ah, yes, correct. Last year we had only capacity utilization of 11% in case of ADC-12. So this year uh, we plan to increase it once these get implemented. And we expect that it should be the derivative should list somewhere in next quarter, and then brand empanelment will start. So maybe in Q4 we have certainly grow in volume, and next year further we'll foresee the volume growth and capacity utilization to higher levels. So this is basically the capacity utilization of Indian plants. But yeah, overall uh, it was around 37 percent for the group uh, as a including the overseas business. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, possible to uh, give us an idea what could be the exit rate of capacity utilization in FY25, the exit rate of your aluminium uh, India operations? Aluminium India operations should touch around 65 to 70 percent. 
Okay, that should be the exit rate, and then that would be the broad base, you know, going forward. Uh, yes, yes. And there will be further capacity addition. Also, we are uh, planning, uh, especially for uh, our country in Ghana. Okay, okay, okay. Great, great. Okay, sir. Uh, thank you so much, and all the best. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, in order to ensure that the management is able to address questions from all participants in the conference, please limit your questions to two per participant. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Shubhmangal Nevetia from Kotak Securities. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, good afternoon, uh, sir, and thank you for this opportunity. Uh, and also thanks for clarifying the accounting uh, 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 treatment, uh, which was kind of highlighted in the notes. Uh, so my first question is on the ongoing Red Sea issue. It was good to see some growth uh, despite the logistic issues which are continuing. Is it possible to share what sort of alternate arrangements we are doing and do we return back to our uh, normal growth of around 20% plus from FI25 onwards? Yeah, this is Vijay Parikh. And uh, I look after the uh, international as well as domestic marketing. So whatever logistic issues was there with respect to this Suez Canal issue, we address that particular issue while uh, diverting the, the volumes to other geographies. Although we are having the customer base around the globe, so wherever we were encountering the problem, we diverted the volumes to, to other, other geographies without affecting the volume, volume growth. So there was some impact on the volumes in the uh, in the quarter three, but uh, now the uh, we have already uh, started shifting the volumes to from quarter three onwards. So now uh, we think uh, the normal uh, the the volume level from the base for the quarter four is the base for the uh, growth of another twenty five percent in the next year. Okay, and what are we uh, uh, compromising or sacrificing when we are diverting? Is it some uh, at the expense of slightly lower margins, or yeah. uh, so, so the margins would be affected, but not that much uh, because we also use of use some arbitrage opportunities. Some of this is getting diverted into India, where the realization is a little better. But of course, the working capital cycle takes a hit uh, whenever we uh, you do some diversification. So it's more uh, towards increase in working capital cycle and less on uh, on EBITDA uh, return margins. Understood, understood. And, I mean, was it completely resolved in fourth quarter or it, it was more of a gradual thing and one few should see further improvement? No, in times to come, once the situation gets normalized, then we will be again using the similar customers. But yes, we have the flexibility also with the customers for uh, for leveraging the volumes. So till now, effect is there, although some part of the impact has been nullified, but uh, yes, the issue is going on. So again, working capital part, which we are lacking at this moment, moment that will be improved further uh, after this situation is uh, further resolved. Okay, okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, that was my, actually, the second question. Uh, the working capital has increased, whereas our guidance has been we should gradually move towards, uh, uh, towards 60, 65 days. So is it possible to share some more details? Why was this increase and do we see it normalizing in 1Q or in FY25 yeah. overall? Yeah, so if you see that, uh, I mean, part of the sales that was that was to happen in Q3 happened in Q4. So you would see a, a lot of, uh, I mean, uh, receivables that has gone up. But as we sit uh, right now, uh, there has been a reduction in uh, receivables by around 100, 125 crores. So it's only a temporary uh, thing. I mean, so the overall inventory levels are in line, of course, although they are a little, uh, I mean, uh, not exactly as per the targets that we have uh, in this art, but uh, once uh, these things normalize, I think we will be back to the, uh, to the same uh, issue. I mean, we will be back to the same target of reducing the inventory level. Also, there is another thing that has happened is that uh, this year we have uh, not uh, taken as much domestic scrap simply because the overseas scrap was much che cheaper compared to the domestic scrap as there were some uh, arbitrage opportunities. Overseas market was lower compared to Indian markets. So we bought more uh, international scrap as compared to domestic scrap. 
So that has also contributed to increase working capital cycle. Although it's a more profitable business, so we have gone and uh, taken more international scrap. So once this arbitrage opportunities, which uh, in this quarter has almost normalized, uh, normalizes, then again the domestic scrap will increase and the overall inventory cycle would reduce. I hope uh, we have answered the, your query, uh, Sumanga. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from the line of Yash from Stallion. Please go ahead. line has been disconnected. The next question is from the line of Hamad from self, from an individual investor. Please go ahead. So thank you for providing me the opportunity. So this, uh, I have only one question. We have provided uh, revenue growth of 25% and bad uh, growth of 25%. Right? Earlier in our vision 2010 program, now in uh, Your voice is not proper. Uh, if you can slightly speak louder. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. So uh, we have we have uh, provided the revenue number as well as the PAT number. It was uh, under the Vision 2027 program and now under 2028 program. So it was 25% uh, uh, revenue growth and 35% PAT growth. But if I take a look at the FY24 numbers, I don't think that the revenue numbers have grown by 25% and the PAT numbers have grown by 35%. Can any specific reason for that? Yes, sir. So uh, actually, uh, when we uh, there are there are two three reasons. First of all, uh, when we mention this 25% uh, CAGR, it's a long-term uh, guidance and it's not a short-term guidance. So there would be years when uh, we would grow faster than 25% and then there would be years when the growth would not be in line with 25%. So if you look at the past five years, the revenue growth is 21% and the PAT growth is 74% CAGR level. This year was also affected by some logistic issues in quarter three, which has impacted the growth rate to some extent. Uh, and we are very confident that going forward, uh, our vision of 2028 uh, of long-term uh, EAGR growth of 25% and uh, PAD growth of 35% uh, is achievable. So, sir, uh, can we expect that the growth numbers in terms of percentage, FY25 over FY24, FY25 over FY24, should be higher than the growth in terms of percentage uh, in FY24 uh, compared to FY23? Yes, you, you, I mean, we, we are optimistic of, uh, of achieving higher growth, but uh, we would stick to the 25% CAGR growth for the next four years. So that is the bottom line. So maybe this year probably would grow maybe 30% also. It can grow at 25% also. But definitely 25% is the minimum growth rate that we can expect in the next year. It would be oh, probably about 25%, but that is the bottom line. Okay, sir. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Raul Bangaria from Lucky Investment Management. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you for taking my question, sir, and uh, congratulations on a good set of numbers and somewhat difficult circumstances. Two questions on the PNL. Uh, one is uh, if you could just give us a sense of uh, the drop in the employee cost that we have seen uh, on a quarter on quarter uh, or, or even a year on year basis. Yeah, so. Uh, Basically, uh, uh, the employee cost includes the, some part of incentives also. So, uh, and the incentive, if we have already, so we make uh, provisions for incentives on a, on a, you know, YTD basis. So, uh, whatever targets we have achieved, uh, 
that that has been already provisioned for in Q3. So there was higher number for Q3 because we have provisions slightly higher, expecting uh, some better numbers in Q4. But uh, because uh, we could not uh, achieve the growth, could not achieve, uh, uh, so then the incentive part is reduced. So accordingly, uh, so this incentive is a is a variable factor which keeps on changing every quarter or uh, every you know. So that is the reason, only reason where employee cost is lower in quarter four as compared to quarter three, because the provision for incentive are higher in quarter three. Okay. And so the second question was uh, on the tax rate. From what uh, we can see in the presentation, the contribution of the Indian operations to the overall PAT is now much higher. In fact, it is almost 3x of what it used to be in two years back. FY22, Indian operations are 25% of PAT. Now this year, it is having almost 75% of PAT. But our tax rate seems to be a low. Uh, to my limited understanding, the tax rates were low because of the contribution of the African operations to the PAT. So, some sense there, please. So actually, uh, I mean, if you look at the total numbers, some of the uh, because there were some arbitrage opportunities in India, because of which we have diverted some of the materials from the African operations into India, and also because of this Red Sea situation, also some of the material from the East African operations were was diverted diverted into India, <laughs> and so the overall increase in EBITDA margin in that if you see uh, that as as against 19. Uh, uh, Rupees per ton, in, uh, we have uh, increased EBITDA numbers, and that has contributed to the increase in the overall uh, profitability from India. No, so my question was uh, more related to the tax rate. And assuming India, India works at a nominal tax rate, and Africa works at a much more subsidized or probably very, very low tax rate. If mm -hmm. the profit contribution from India is uh, this high. I, I would have agreed that the tax rate should have been higher. So, but the tax rates have not gone higher. They remain in that 10, 12 percent range. So that's why I'm asking. Yeah. So basically, India is, in India also we have tax advantage uh, in Chittoor, where we uh, are enjoying 100 percent tax uh, exemption. So, whatever profit contribution is from Chittoor, that is 100 percent tax free. So, because uh, whenever we are importing certain goods from Africa to India. That is uh, majorly processed in Chittur itself. So uh, that is the reason we have the higher margins in Chittur and which is tax free entity. So, so tax percentage has not gone up because of this issue. But uh, Chittur has some special, uh, you know, tax exemption under some some government. Uh... Yeah, ADIA exemption for Chittur. Okay. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is in the line of Sabri from MK Global. Please go ahead. Yeah, good afternoon, sir. So um, I have two questions. Uh, firstly, uh, regarding this uh, BWMR regulation, so it's been like one year now. Uh, so how has been the experience? Has, have we seen a uh, share of organized volumes in the industry going up? And uh, what is the expectation for the next one year in terms of implementation of this? Yes, so after implementation of this, the next stage was EPR was the additional thing which was created under the, this regulation. So now the central portal has started working. The producers have been registered and uh, recycler also getting registered. And uh, the EPR certificate for the financial year 22-23 are also in the process of generation by various recyclers. The next stage is the EPR penalty. So for non-compliances, those numbers are yet to be released. So there are meetings going between the producers and recyclers. So we hope by next quarters, the EPR uh, penalties will come. So that will create a financial model. So that will be the second stage. So certainly uh, the numbers are growing. The producers are getting them registered and they will be diverting more material to formal sector. So some of the some of the manufacturers and the brand owners are uh, basically waiting and watching, but once these uh, penalties uh, are uh, decided, decided, so uh, then probably those who are watching also will start implementing this uh, waste management. So uh, 
Overall, we believe that after this uh, first quarter when the penalties are decided, there will be even further increase from the current levels also. Right now, is that 35 percent or uh, is it like higher or lower? So it, it would be same. I mean, there, there is definitely some increase. So it would be around 40 percent uh, currently. Uh, the organized sector would have increased. 40 percent versus say 35 percent couple of years back, right? Yeah, but uh, you must understand that overall, in the first year, the the requirement is also only 30 percent. So it will only. Gain traction once the 50 percent or 70 percent and then 90 percent of the total volume uh, that has to be recycled would come into play. So 30 percent is not not uh, uh, that difficult. But now from 30 to 50 percent, if they want to do it in the second year, then uh, the uh, I mean people will start uh, going for more uh, from the retail. Right, sir. Got it. And second question is on uh, on uh, this uh, depreciation. So it has increased. So which is which are the plants or capex which has been uh, expensed this quarter? Yeah, basically uh, major uh, expansion we did it in Mudra. So which is which have started uh, Mudra, Mudra and Togo. Togo was a new facility. Uh, so uh, so these are the two new plants. Or uh, uh, also we have shifted the new facility in Senegal. So that's also, uh, uh, although the capacity is not changed significantly, but uh, yes, there is the plant was totally new. So there is a reason uh, there is a higher depreciation in this year. Was there any working capital impact from this also? Not that much. Actually, CAPEX is only a small part. Most of the working capital cycle is affected by uh, higher inventories are payable than receivables, etc. No, I mean, this new plants having uh, new inventories, so anything of that sort? No, no, no not, not nothing much. much. So, so this was basically due to new markets only and Red Sea disruption by the working capital sub. Yes. Right. Thank you so much and all the rest. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Janesh Karia from Antique Stock Broking. Please go ahead. Oh, yeah, hello, Emma. Yes, you are able. Uh, yeah, thank you for the opportunity. So my question is again on the depreciation part. Um, uh, so on a sequential basis also, uh, like uh, like the earlier participant mentioned, there is a very sharp jump in depreciation, and also on the annual basis, the average rate of depreciation turns out to be around seven and a half to eight percent of the gross block, compared to around six six and a half percent in the last year. So what should be the annual depreciation rate we should be uh, thing going forward, and is there any change in depreciation policy that we have taken? Yeah, slightly. Uh, there was higher depreciation because of, uh, as, I, as we discussed, that uh, the new facility, in, especially in Africa, there the uh, depreciation rates are slightly higher. So uh, we started two new facilities in Africa, Senegal, and Togo. So, but going forward, uh, the depreciation rate, as we do more capex in India. Uh, so that the depreciation will uh, depreciation rate will come down to same levels as we were earlier. Okay, uh, that's helpful. Uh, secondly, is on the uh, EBITDA per turn for the aluminium segment. Uh, so currently we are doing approximately uh, 14 to 15 rupees per kg. Of, uh, sorry, 12 to 13 rupees per kg of EBITDA per uh, of EBITDA for aluminium segment. Going forward, once the MCX hedging is in place, what do we see the uh, uh, stabilized EBITDA for aluminium segment? So in this quarter, uh, so uh, the annual number for aluminium per ton is around 12,000 rupees. Uh, but uh, for this quarter four, we uh, realized around 15, 15, rupees, 15 rupees per kg. So that 15 to 16 rupees uh, per kg is a you know, fair estimate of uh, uh, going forward uh, EBITDA per ton for aluminium. Okay, and uh, this is at the uh, current utilization levels, 15, 16. So as uh, utilization levels improve, is there a possibility of per kg EBITDA improving or uh, 15, 16 will remain constant? So 15, 16, uh, 15 to 16 is a range. Uh, so we can reach to slightly towards 16 uh, if the, uh, this capacity utilization goes uh, uh, improved in, in this year. Uh, okay, uh, so next is, uh, if you can just help us uh, with the domestic scrap collection for India plants for the fourth quarter. So, uh, domestic scrap collection for India is, uh, in this year, 
The fourth quarter is approximately 40% uh, for, for the Indian scrap requirement. Uh, okay, okay, that's it. So I'll come back in the queue for a few more questions. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Praful Siddharth from Shravas Capital. Please go ahead. Mm -hmm. Hi, sir. So, could you please throw more light on your interpretation of NDAS 19 with regard to auditors' qualification? Because based on our understanding of NDAS 19, this expense is something which needs to be taken to the P&L, not another equity. Okay, so uh, basically, first we need to understand the transaction which we did, uh, uh, and then uh, in light of uh, the yes. So one, uh, I think we mentioned that there were some equity shares which were held by the trust for the, and the scheme was that the appreciation will be distributed to the, uh, distributed or utilized for the benefit of the employees of the uh, Gravita Group. So this was a scheme. So uh, when we sold those shares, there was some gain and uh, so we, uh, uh, because it is a treasury share, so we were not supposed to, uh, you know, uh, book the gains in the P&L. It, it was supposed to go to the uh, equity part, uh, directly to the reserve. And uh, uh, when it came to the uh, distribution or utilization of that uh, amount for the employee benefit, so it was suggested to, uh, auditor have suggested it to, to be uh, provision for, uh, for, for in the employee benefit expenses. But our contention was that uh, since it is a distribution of the income which is not, uh, you know, which is gained from the shares held. So uh, the, it was not a share-based payment according to the, according to our estimate and the, the opinion, legal opinion we have taken from various law firms. So it, it, it was supposed to go to the uh, only, uh, the, the, uh, the distribution was supposed to go to the uh, reserve only uh, as, we did, as, as it was uh, the treatment for the income also. So income and, so what we did is we have considered the income also in the other equity and uh, um, the, the, the provision also uh, in the other equity. So there is a liability standing on the balance sheet and there is a uh, investment which is lying on. So in future, uh, there will be distribution of this uh, of this uh, yes. amount gain uh, to the employees, and then uh, it both of both of the legs will be, will be squared off. So, uh, but auditors was having a different opinion or interpretation of the accounting standard, and uh, we took our own opinion, uh, including some opinion from EY also. Uh, based on that, we uh, concluded this. Right. So we took the opinion from EY, so. Yes. Got it. Got it. So just one more accounting question. So in FY23, we recognize the forward contract gain in other income. And in FY22, we recognize the forward contract loss in other expenses. So considering the accounting policy in FY22, don't you think we should have directed the gains from other expenses in FY23 instead of taking it to other income? So why has there been a change in accounting policy here? So uh, it is like, uh, so what we do is whenever there is a uh, loss of on the hedging it goes to the other expense whenever there is a gain on the uh, commodity hedging it goes to the other income so uh, so as per uh, this is account as per the accounting standard but because the hedging is uh, part of the operational transactions uh, or it's a, in in back to back against the uh, physical transaction, so we consider this other income, uh, other expense is always part of EBITDA, but other income, uh, normally it is to be excluded from the EBITDA part, but uh, since it is part of our, um, it is part of our operational income, we consider adjusted EBITDA and we report it in that way, uh, so that we can we consider this as the operational income. Got it, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. The next question is in line of Parikshit Kabra from PKD Advisors. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I first wanted to understand that last quarter our EBITDA margins rose up to 11% because you know we were diverting to new customers uh, and using the cheaper raw material. This time it's come down to 8%. Uh, can you explain that, how that has happened, and what should we expect in the next couple of quarters? So, so, basically, so basically, last year we had mentioned that there were some arbitrage opportunities present in India because of which the EBITDA margins were higher. 
but this quarter it's not 8 percent it's 10.76 percent so there is there was some increase in emitter percentage in q4 uh, in in last year, uh, uh, last quarter uh, the emitter margins were 11.83 percent which was abnormally high because there were some arbitrage opportunities in india and we had diverted that material into india but you can expect a 9 to 10 percent emitter margins on a on a on a sustainable basis going forward so maybe in your calculation, as you mentioned, that uh, we are considering this hedging income also as a operational income, which is part of the EBITDA. So uh, if you include that, so this, uh, which is for this, uh, for this quarter four, it is approximately 21 crore. And for the entire full year, it is 47 crore. Fair enough. Understood. Understood. Uh, second you question. Uh, uh, this EBITDA number, uh, Will uh, will be approximate as uh, EBITDA percentage is approximately seven ten point seven six percent for quarter four and ten point four seven percent for the full year. Got it. Understood. So the second question that I've had was that um, you know I understand that SC issue had created has created some level of issues for us and we have missed our guidance a long term guidance but divided into shorter term we have missed it this year. Uh, and next year you have given a guidance on a top line of 25%, but can you break this down like in the sense like what are we expecting next quarter? Or is this also going to, this 25% growth is also going to be backloaded towards this third and fourth quarter, or can we start expecting that from the first quarter itself? So part of this growth you can start expecting from first quarter itself, so it will not be too much uh, uh, towards the, the last quarter. So, I mean, quarter on quarter basis, generally it's very difficult to to give you any guidance. But definitely, it's between 20 to 30 percent throughout the throughout the year, unless then something strange happens again. I mean, like if everything remains normal, you can expect a 20 to 30 percent growth rate on a quarter to quarter basis. But even for quarter one, it is too difficult to give guidance because we're sitting in quarter one, right? Yeah, so you can expect, as I mentioned, you can expect 20 to 30 percent growth rate in the first quarter also. Got it. And uh, aluminium business now that, uh, I, I, from what I understand, that we were holding back only because of an ability to hedge. Now that the hedging is going to be possible in Q1, what kind of uh, volume growth or you know top line growth are you expecting for the aluminium business in the, this quarter or the next quarter? So the benefit should arrive somewhere around next quarter because it has been notified uh, in the month of March, but the effective contract should start somewhere in next quarter. And the physical delivery th thing should happen in further Q3. So we should expect uh, this advantage of uh, hedging somewhere around Q3 onwards. So as we mentioned, that Indian utilization was low lower, that was only 11%, that should go to 60% uh, after Q3 and Q4. So that number will come. Certainly, uh, whatever we did last year in aluminium business, that will grow at least by 60 to 70 percent in terms of volumes. Because we have, we are also adding capacity at certain location at Ghana, at should operational in two, beginning of the Q2. Got it. So just to repeat and uh, make sure I understood correctly, from last year to this year in volume terms, aluminium business should see a 60 to 70 percent growth. Yes. All right. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. The next question is from line of Ankit from Market Court Research Private Limited. Please go ahead. Yeah. My question is, uh, in terms of actually for the certificate, right, what percentage of volume in India uh, are we generating which can go for Sorry to interrupt, sir. May I request you to please use your handset? Okay, so my question is, what is the EPD certificate which we have generated in India already? Which is eligible for sale? Yes, we have generated EPR certificate for uh, lidocine batteries, for plastics. So these data are already available on a portal. So you want the number, the quantities? Yes, I want the number and quantity, and what is the the sales we realize of that? See, the realization will take place later once we start trading them. So we have generated, and wherever we took material from the producer, in that case, those will be given 
in turn because the material is being given right. by that particular battery manufacturer to us. So that will be traded in lieu of the material given. For the rest of the producers, whenever they will come to fulfill their liability of EPR, then this will be traded. So the fair price will come out whenever there is a penalty is finalized. So that we will foresee in next quarter. So as of now, the financial numbers cannot be, it's not available. So let us see what number it comes. So what is the volume uh, against which we have EPR generated, right? Because that is... No, 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 no. 24,000 24, for 22, 23. 23. 23 is around 25,000 tons. And what percentage of it this is for lead? This is for lead only. It's for lead. And plastics numbers are different. As of it's not ready available, but we can certainly share. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Vikas Mystery from Moonshot Venture. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. You guys have a couple of questions. Uh, last quarter, we are losing some of the tolling business. So can you quantify in this quarter how much we are uh, losing on tolling business and how we can be so sure that uh, there will be strong rebound in the next quarter? So, uh, sir, I, I would like to just correct you a little bit that we are not losing the tolling business, but we, we have decided to rely more on international battery because uh, there were some arbitrage opportunities in last quarter where Indian prices were higher. So it was more beneficial for the company to import batteries instead of using the domestic batteries. But in this quarter, we have uh, we have increased the total quantity that has come up. So overall, if you talk about in the Indian uh, import and domestic procurement, we have increased the procurement by 22% last year. Uh, but we have imported more than we have used the domestic batteries. But in the last quarter, if you look at it, we have, uh, I mean, uh, again started using domestic batteries, and it's around 11,000 uh, tons of 12,000 tons of domestic batteries that we have uh, bought this year. So it's, if you compare it with the uh, Q3, which was around 10,000 tons, so it's around 20% growth over Q3 in the last quarter for domestic batteries. Okay, okay. You want to say that uh, whatever the red juice is there, you have, uh, you are not materially impacted from here on. That's what you want to say. No, no. Red sea is basically an impact on the sales of our products from India to, and, and East Africa to Europe. It has not impacted the import of battery scrap into India because from, uh, we are importing from America and from Africa. There it is, uh, uh, it, there is no impact of red sea on import of battery scrap into India or very little impact of into India. Okay, so so you are fairly confident that the volume drop will come back uh, in Q1. Yes. So as I mentioned, that we have grown, we have uh, the total procurement growth in India is 22 percent last year. Mm -hmm. So whether it comes from domestic or it comes from international, uh, the overall growth in battery scrap is 22 percent. Mm -hmm. So we we always look look at the best option to uh, to buy. So if if the import prices are lower. Then we buy international battery, and if the domestic prices are more uh, viable, then we uh, increase the battery procurement locally. Okay, okay. My last question is that uh, we have said that uh, we are going to through MCX with this aluminium alloy. So how much of our portfolio is still after doing this? After doing this, how, how much of our portfolio is still unhedged? So after, if, if we start doing hedging on aluminium, only plastic remains on hedge, but otherwise lead and aluminium would be 100% hedged. Okay, aluminium, uh, all, all other alloys will be as well, only to ADC-12 yes. will be hedged. ADC-12 no? is around 90% hedged. Okay, okay. Okay, thank you. 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 So just to clarify, lead is fully held at this moment, but uh, uh, aluminium is partly held just uh, because we don't have, at this moment, we don't have uh, the hedging mechanism in place. But uh, as mentioned, that whenever we have this platform of MCX, uh, we will be doing 100% hedging for aluminium also. Currently, we do some hedging of aluminium, which are on LME, but that's a non-ADC product. Okay, okay, okay. Thanks. That's all from my side. Thank you.
The next question is from the line of Tia Brijuani from White Whale Partners. Please go ahead. Am I audible? Yes. Yeah. So my question was on the regulation bit. If I compare the 2001 regulation uh, versus the 2022, 2001 also had some guidelines around, uh, let's say, for the producer. They had the responsibility to collect back, let's say, 50% of the new battery sold. So my, and things didn't change materially after that in terms of like informal shares still remained high. So my question is, what is fundamentally different in the 2022 regulations, uh, which would basically divert the ULAPs from the retailers uh, versus what was there in 2001? So am I reading this correct? And what's your view on that? Yeah. So you clearly told correctly when it came in 2001 the percentage they were to collect was 70 80 90 and 100 by next four years but the regulation which was applicable was applicable on everyone all hundred thousands of retailers were also part of that regulations they were to file return but effectiveness was not there because if you apply the regulation on and thousands of people, lakhs of people, it will not be effective. So the, there was one more change was brought in 2010 where bulk customers were added. So slightly from bulk customer side, the battery or scrap was generated and it was coming in the system. But in this regulation of 2022, two things were the major. Here the uh, regulation has been effective. It will be on producers only. So here you have to regulate few people. In case of lead acid battery, there are 10 or 15 major producers of batteries. So it is easy to implement the regulation. Second part, EPR. In old regulation, there was no responsibility. So there was no EPR. There is no EPR uh, penalty. So these two things will change the landscape of the regulation. Got it. So just to follow up on that, let's say... Uh, I, as a retailer, I'm getting a higher price from the informal guys just because they don't follow uh, the compliance norms or, let's say, there's GST evasion and stuff. But uh, you're saying that this 2022 regulation, will it enable us to come at par with those prices? Because retailers were the main point of leakage of these uh, use labs. So are you alluding to that? Yeah, so one of the premises of putting the owners on the brand owners is that they can control the supply chain. So most of the batteries, uh, uh, new batteries, where, wherever the new batteries are sold, they are sold and replacement of the old batteries are done at the same place. So the premise is that whenever you need a new battery, you will get an old battery in view of that new battery. So if the brand owners, battery manufacturers like Kamala Raja and Excite, they can uh, because they control the supply chain, they can put pressure on these retailers to give back the old battery. Only then they will give the new battery to them. Then they can, to some extent, control and reduce the uh, number of batteries going to the unorganized channel. That is the first part. And once they start doing it, probably the channel will follow. So uh, hopefully it will start uh, having impact in the future. And of course there are other... other uh, things also that is happening because GST is being implemented in a proper manner. The government is getting stricter in terms of GST evasion and all those things. So they, these are also some of the policies that are helping this uh, shift from unorganized to organized. Okay. Cool. That's it from my side. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Kush Nahar from Electrum PMS. Please go ahead. Yeah. Hi. Thank you for the opportunity. So my first question was, what was our domestic scrap collection for Indian operations as a percentage? So for automobile, it was 40%. 40%, okay. okay. And since so the presentation, I see that there is this uh, Australia, which has been added in terms of a procurement network. So what's the strategy there? Are we looking at new products over there, or is it the existing vertical zone that we're expanding the network for? Yeah, so uh, we have started sourcing, developing some uh, vendor network in Australia also, and we have we have started sourcing uh, some uh, battery scrap uh, from from Australia. And in future, we are thinking of uh, putting up some our own yards also in in Australia. Okay, sir.
And so just one last question on the EBITDA margins after the aluminium hedging. What will be the sustainable EBITDA per kg we can guide across all three segments? For aluminium, you're talking about 15 to 16 rupees. Yeah, and the other two, uh, lead and plastic also. So uh, lead, uh, we expect to 18 to 19 rupees per kg. And for plastic, 10 to 11 rupees per kg. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is in the line of Basant Patel from TCGM AMC. Please go ahead. Hello. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, sir, just one uh, question on the domestic front industry scenario. Even Amaraja is also getting into one lakh uh, tons of the lead recycling capacity. So even if excise this uh, segment recycling lead capacity, so don't you feel the uh, domestic would, would be more pressure to procure the uh, raw materials? Uh, battery components and all. So how do you feel this? No, no, so, so the opportunity itself is huge. Uh, so uh, currently if you look at the total capacities in the organized sector, they are not uh, capable to uh, fulfill the entire requirement. So every every uh, battery manufacturer, just because he has to comply with the new regulations, would, would have to find solutions. So part of it is going to come from uh, contract manufacturing with companies like us, uh, uh, organized the sector, and then part of it is going to come by their own internal uh, capacities. So uh, I, I think it's it, it's going to uh, it's not it, the, the, because the opportunity itself is so huge that even if their capacities come, uh, it, it will not overall impact uh, growth that we have envisaged for the next uh, four five years. So whatever you procure from Amaraja, that is going to be lost going ahead. Is that so, you can? So basically, what is going to happen is that Amaraja is only putting up a plant in south, but they sell this battery everywhere in India. So we have plants in north, we have plants in central India, we have plants in west India. So wherever the battery is getting sold in these regions, they they would come to either us or companies like us. Uh, the specific benefit that we have is that we can process it in in the in the northern plants and then we can give the finished products to Amara Raja uh, from the south plant itself. So th that gives us an advantage over the competition. So uh, and similarly, there are other uh, battery manufacturers also. If this gets implemented, only two of the uh, big players like Exide or Amara Raja are the players who can put up their own plant or who can buy these batteries. The smaller players would also need partners like us. So there is a huge opportunity uh, there also, when these small uh, players who do not have that much clout in, on the supply chain, they would need a partner like us to collect that battery from the retailers and then process it and then give it to back to them. So that would be other uh, requirement that will come up. So overall, if you look at the total capacity, the plant that they are putting is not even 20% of the total capacity in India, aside and Amara Raja currently. Yes, that is correct. So industry opportunity is huge largely, so that will not be a threat for us actually. Yes. Yeah. So then one more thing actually, I missed the uh, one part that uh, you were commenting on the lead procurement from India would be more uh, expensive than lead what you are going to procure from outside for the recycling material uh, outside India. What is that statement? Can you please... Uh, it's basically India market moves independent to the international markets. So sometimes there is a scenario where Indian markets are much higher. During those times, it makes more sense for us to bring international material into India, process it in India, and then supply to the Indian markets, rather than procuring it in India. So there is an arbitrage opportunity during those times, which was uh, in the Q3 and part of Q4. Uh, so we take uh, benefit of, uh, whenever those uh, arbitrage opportunities arise. So that is why you will see that the uh, overall EBITDA margin was also higher in Q3 uh, because imported batteries were cheaper. Uh, but these are not, these are not, uh, uh, I mean, uh, these uh, opportunities are not continuous. So there would be certain times in the year then when you will have these uh, opportunities. Otherwise. The best way to deal is whenever you have Indian requirement, you buy Indian material and give it to Indian suppliers, Indian buyers, sorry, and the international market, uh, you buy international material and supply to the international markets. 
am I uh, clear in this? I, I, I'm, I'm clear, yeah. So in two four, actually, if you look at the sorry to interrupt. Uh, due to time constraint, we would like to move on to the next question. I would I would request Mr. Basant to follow up in the queue. The next question is from the line of Siddharth Mehrotra from Kotak Institutional Equities. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, sir. Am I audible? Yes, you are, sir. Uh, so just a quick question on your CapEx numbers. So I was just looking at uh, the CapEx you had guided for uh, in your previous presentation versus the new presentation. And I see that uh, the FI24 CapEx is actually much smaller than we had uh, guided in the past. So can you just explain uh, what sort of projections uh, we are altering, what is the uh, progress on our new verticals and so on, and how should we look at this CapEx? Will it be majorly back-ended towards FI26-27? What are your views on that, sir? Yeah. So, uh, yes, you're right. Some of the uh, CapEx that we had planned for uh, for the new verticals, especially lithium and battery recycling, uh, we were not able to uh, do that in last year, and it spilled over to this year. And uh, you will see that uh, coming up in this year, the lithium ion facility in Mundra. And part of that, uh, from the existing vertical, part of uh, it was to put up a uh, new facility for aluminium recycling in Mundra, uh, which was also delayed because we were not having any hedging mechanism, so we did not want to put a, a, a new capacity because until the hedging, uh, hedging mechanism is there, we did not want to uh, go into putting up a capex that, uh, so we realized that uh, later. So we changed our strategy a little bit and we started putting up uh, capacities of aluminium recycling overseas. But now, once this uh, uh, hedging mechanism is live, then we may uh, start thinking about uh, putting up this capacity again. So these are two major factors that affected the CAPEX plans. Understood, sir. And what about the progress on the new divisions which we were sort of overseeing, the, the paper and the steel parts? So paper is also, uh, uh, also uh, we had also mentioned that paper would not, paper and steel would probably come in financial year 26 and 27. So uh, uh, they are in line. Uh, we are doing our due diligence completely, complete, I mean, uh, due diligence. So, uh, it will take some time, probably uh, two, uh, second quarter of this year, the due diligence will be completed and then we'll start uh, on CAPEX for these two uh, new verticals also. But we are, um, meanwhile, we are uh, more focused for this year. We are more focused on rubber, expansion of rubber, and putting up a lithium ion first plant in India. Uh, uh, focused on expansion and rubber, you mean for the Indian plants or the African plants? Sir? So it, it would be basically so far what we have done in rubber is for captive consumption. So these would be standalone rubber plants in India, both for gum rubber and uh, for pyrolysis oil. Okay, so we also plan to sell them externally, if my understanding is correct. Yes. Got it, sir. Uh, thanks. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the last question for today. I would like to hand the conference over to the management for closing comments. Thank you. Thank you everyone for participating in this call. We trust that we have addressed all your inquiries during the session. However, if there are any remaining questions, please feel free to reach out to our investor relations team. Once again, we extend our gratitude to all the participants for joining us today. Thank you and have a great day. On behalf of Antique Stock Broking, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us and you may now disconnect your lines.